So welcome to, oops, <laughs> some tech issues right off the bat. Welcome to Unit 5, States of Consciousness, Module 22, Understanding Consciousness and Hypnosis. Um, this is a very short module, uh, only three learning targets, being able to describe the place of consciousness in psychology's history, which is rather interesting. Uh, being able to define hypnosis and describe how a hypnotist can influence a hypnotized subject and <laughs> discuss whether hypnosis is an extension of normal consciousness or actually an altered state. So there are two figures that are discussed in the Meyer Psychology for the AP uh, Course 3rd Edition that is the text that I'm following along as being major figures in consciousness research, William James and Sigmund Freud. James discussed consciousness as a stream of consciousness with each moment flowing into the next. Freud, on the other hand, believed that unconscious was a hiding place for our most anxiety provoking ideas and emotions and that uncovering those hidden thoughts could lead to healing. In terms of the history of psychology, the first half of the 20th century in the United States, especially, the study of consciousness was abandoned for the behavioral zeitgeist. The spirit of that time was that we should be focused on observable behavior. And John Watson and then B.F. Skinner uh, created a path that made it, you know, that, that psychologists were really focused on the observable behavior of others and how we could you know, sort of shape that behavior. Um, and they were less concerned. They thought that psychologists shouldn't be interested in what was going on with inside the mind. Psychologists wanted to talk about what could be seen. So, but after 1960, the study of mental processes rebounded again. Neuroscience started linking the brain activity to consciousness later on. And the study of consciousness now is a large field of study and how it can be altered. It's a very big field of study now. Consciousness defined is our subjective awareness of ourselves and our environment. Our conscious awareness is one part of the dual processing model that we mentioned in an earlier module of our two track minds. Although much of our information processing is conscious, more of it is unconscious and automatic and actually outside of our conscious awareness. Now hypnosis is a social interaction between a hypnotist and a subject and Within this interaction, the hypnotist suggests to another person, the subject, that certain perceptions, feelings, thoughts, or behaviors will spontaneously occur. In addition to normal waking awareness, consciousness comes to us in altered states, including daydreaming, sleeping, drug-induced hallucinating, and even meditating. What are some questions about hypnosis? I find that many people are very interested in this topic and often have misconceptions about hypnosis. So here are some common questions. Can anyone experience hypnosis? To some extent, we are all somewhat suggestible, but about 20% of people are highly hypnotizable, and these people are often highly imaginative. And children usually make fairly good subjects for hypnosis. Can you actually recall forgotten events? Not really. All of our life experiences are not actually stored in memory banks. Some memories retrieved through hypnosis seem to really mix that fact with fiction. What is a post-hypnotic suggestion and how effective is it? Well, it's a suggestion made during hypnosis to be carried out after the subject is no longer hypnotized, used by some clinicians to help control undesired symptoms and behaviors. Post-hypnotic suggestions have helped alleviate headaches, asthma, and stress-related anxiety, and even skin disorders. Within hypnosis, can I be forced to act against my will? Well, hypnotized people who are, in, according to studies, hypnotized people who are induced to put their hand into acid, quote unquote, at the command of the hypnoto hypnotist, later denied that they would ever follow that order. The same researchers tested a control group who pretended they were hypnotized. Lab assistants were unaware of who was hypnotized and who was not. Both groups performed the same dangerous act of putting their hands in what they believed was acid, showing that it was not hypnosis that made them follow the command. 
Now, how about hypnotherapy? Well, hypnotherapists try to help patients harness their own healing powers. Some different studies um, are discussed within this module. In one analysis of 18 studies, the average client who, whose therapy was supplemented with hypnosis showed greater improvement than 70% of the therapy patients. So that's a pretty good um, difference there. Hypnosis seemed especially helpful for the treatment of obesity, but drug, alcohol, and smoking addictions have not responded well to hypnosis. What are some other frequently asked questions about hypnosis? Can hypnosis relieve pain? Well, it seems like yes. When unhypnotized people put their arm in an ice bath, they felt intense pain within 25 seconds. When hypnotized people did the same after being given suggestions to feel no pain, they indeed reported feeling little pain. Is hypnosis just an extension of normal consciousness? Well, the social influence theory of hypnosis explains that people begin to feel and behave in ways appropriate for good hypnotic subjects. So the more the individual being hypnotized likes and trusts the hypnotist, the more they allow that person to direct their attention and fantasies. Is hypnosis an altered state? Well, one psychologist, Hilgard, believed hypnosis involved not only social influence, but also a dual processing state that's sort of special called dissociation, which is a split between different levels of consciousness. He viewed this dissociation as a vivid form of everyday mind splits, similar to like when you're doodling, maybe you're listening to this and you're just doodling. I listen to lectures and I doodle all over my page all the time. And that was what he would say. That would be sort of that dissociation um, or uh, typing the end of a sentence while starting a conversation, those kind of things. How did he test this hypothesis? Well, he would take a hypnotized person um, who may be exhibiting no pain when the arm was placed in the ice bath and when the same hypnotized person would be placed, um, was asked to press a key if some part of he or she felt pain, that person did. So well, how do the two theories that we just mentioned explain hypnosis? So attention is diverted from a painful ice bath, but how? Well, the divided consciousness theory would say hypnosis has caused a split in awareness, whereas the social influence theory would say the subject is so caught up in the hypnotized role that she ignores she's cold. Is it dissociated mind or well-behaved subject? The, bio <laughs> the biopsychosocial approach that we've mentioned many, many times in many modules within this course explains hypnosis. There are biological influences, distinctive brain activity, unconscious information processing. There are also psychological influences, focused attention, expectations, heightened suggestibility, dissociation between normal sensations and conscious awareness, and then also social cultural influences presence of an authoritative figure um, in legitimate context, the role of playing a good subject. So all of those things combine together according to the biopsychosocial approach to explain how hypnosis happens. So we're back to our learning targets already. So the place of consciousness in psychology's history. After initially claiming consciousness as its area of study in the 19th century, psychologists abandoned it in the first half of the 20th century due to the behavioral zeitgeist. zeitgeist. Since 1960, under the influence of cognitive psychology and neuroscience, consciousness has resumed its place as an important area of research. So what is hypnosis? It's a social interaction in which one person suggests to another that certain perceptions, feelings, thoughts, or behaviors will spontaneously occur. Hypnosis does not enhance the recall of forgotten events. It may even evoke false memories. Okay, so that's really important to understand because I think oftentimes one of the myths that many people who aren't that familiar with hypnosis believe is that hypnosis does enhance uh, forgotten events, but that has not been um, found in research studies. It, hypnosis cannot force people to act against their will, though hypnotized people, like unhypnotized people, may perform unlikely acts. Post-hypnotic suggestions have helped people harness their own healing powers, but have not been very effective in treating addiction. Hypnosis can help relieve pain. Okay, finally, 
Social influence theory suggests that hypnotized people act out the role of the good subject. They're just doing sort of what they think they should do. They're influenced by the social situation they're in. Other psychologists view hypnosis as a dissociation, a split between normal sensations and conscious awareness. Sort of like I said earlier, you know, the idea that you're doodling while you're listening to a lecture, that would be a dissociation. They would be considered similar. Okay, that's it. That was a very quick module. <laughs> um, thank you for listening. Take care.